Good to see this number out this morning. Appreciate your presence. If you have your Bible, we'll be turning to 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll begin there in just a moment of time. I always encourage people to get their Bible and weigh what I say by the Word of God. In a few moments, we'll stand and sing the song that's been suggested. And if you've never put on Christ in baptism, all things have been made ready where you can confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Have your sins blotted out by the blood of Christ and be added to the family of God and enjoy every spiritual blessing in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or if you need to be restored as we stand and sing, we pray that you'll make your way to the front and that we can pray with and for you and help you with any spiritual need. In 2 Peter chapter 2, begin reading with me at verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. You know, I think many times in our preaching, one thing that's hard to do is maintain a balance. Many times I'll go through and I'll observe that I've preached many sermons about grace, and I think that's needed. I think that we need to preach on the grace of God, lest we misunderstand God's amazing grace, and we forget what God is willing to do to save us. I think we need to preach on the love of God. In John 3, 16, I don't know how many sermons I've heard on that text or how many I've preached, but I'm never ashamed to go back and preach on that text and look at what the Bible says about the love of God and how it is amazing. But many times, if we're not careful, we may go a while without hearing about the severity of God. I need to hear about the goodness of God, and likewise, I need to understand He is a God of justice. And just as I bring out His mercy and grace, I need to see that He is a wrathful God, a just God. And as we read in 2 Peter 2, many times He is what we might call an unsparing God. If you will, look in your Bible in 2 Peter chapter 2 and notice exactly what the Apostle Peter had to say in regard to the wrath of God in verse 4. He said, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Underscore, God did not spare the angels who sinned. Now, there's a lot about angels I do not know. I do know they're created beings. I know that they are in some heavenly realm. And I recognize that they're subject to God. But if you read your Bible in 2 Peter 2, you'll find that in some way, angels sin. If you take your Bible and go to the little book of Jude, you remember that that is a small book, but a powerful book. Jude shed some light about this in verse 6. When the writer said, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, I do not know exactly what these angels did by not keeping their proper abode or habitation. But one thing I know, they violated the will of God. And notice the Bible said God did not spare them that in their rebellion, in their sin, God cast them out. And notice the Bible says he cast them out and he reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So one thing I observe when I take my Bible in 2 Peter 2 or in Jude 6, I see that God is an unsparing God. That when God heard and saw and witnessed the sin of the angels, that God did not spare them that here were created beings, and God said that he will put them in chains until the judgment day when they will be cast into everlasting fire. If you take your Bible, you remember that in the judgment scene we see in Matthew 25 that Jesus said in verse 41, he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. Now watch it. Prepare for the devil and his angels. 
Those are the ones who were not spared. Those are the ones who sinned against God by not keeping their proper domain and leaving that habitation. They violated God's law. They sinned against God, and God spared them not. Now, I want to stop and think about that for just a moment. I've often thought about here are angelic beings, and if God did not spare them when they violated the will of God and went contrary to God's will, what about humans? Do we think that we'll be an exception if we live in a way that's contrary to God's will? I want to tell you, we must always look at the mercy and grace of God, but never forget His justice and wrath. But then if you go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, look at the very next verse. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, he talked about that God did not spare the ancient world. And notice he's talking about in the days of Noah. He said he saved Noah, one of eight people who was a preacher of righteousness, but he brought in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Of all the people that continued to live in sin, God destroyed them. God told Noah what to build. He said, you build an ark. God told Noah what to use. You use gopher wood. And Noah did exactly what God said. Hebrews 11 says he is a man of faith. And he and the seven others got into the ark, and God closed the door. But notice that those who did not get into the ark, he spared not. They were all taken away in the flood. If you have your Bible for just a moment, look in Matthew 24. And when you come to Matthew 24, observe the text that Jesus talked about when he spoke about Noah, and he talked about what happened to them who did not get into the ark. Notice he says in verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until... The day Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and watch it, took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Jesus said, Notice that in that day they continued to live life to the fullest. They were marrying, they were giving in marriage, they were eating, they were drinking until the day Noah got in the ark and the flood came and took them all away. You know what that shows me? He gives a comparison. He said, that's going to be what the second coming is like. There are going to be people on this earth. They're not prepared, even though they've been warned. Though they've heard the gospel, though they've heard the truth, they know they need to obey Jesus. They know they need to be right with God. They have heard the word, but they've ignored the word. And in their ignoring what God has said, there's going to come a surprise for them. He's going to come when they least expect it. He is comparing that in 2 Peter 3 to like a thief in the night. And you know, my friend, if God not spared the people in the days of Noah, what do you think God will do today with people who have ignored and disobeyed His will? Have you ever thought about He's given a distinct warning? Do you think he would spare people who've lived just as ungodly today as they lived in Noah's day, though they know they need to make their life right? If you have your Bible, look, if you will, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And when the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, notice what he says beginning at verse 7. In verse 7, he talked about to give those who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Those were angels who did not be cast out but look at verse 8 in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who one did not know God and two on those who did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ these in verse 9 shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints, and be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Now you look at that very carefully. Paul gives a warning just as Jesus warned, there's going to come a day, and the Lord's going to come, and we're going to meet him, and he talks about those who will receive rest, and then those who will be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Never again to be in the presence of light, life, and love. 
but to be in eternal darkness and death and destruction. To be separated from God the Creator. Oh, I would, I could put it into the heart that when I look at God, I see that God spared not the angels and God spared not the ancient world. He is the unsparing God. Oh, He is a God of love and, and, and a God of mercy, but at the same time, He's a God of justice and a God of wrath. But then if you take your Bible, look again in 2 Peter 2. And notice a third thing that Peter brings out. In 2 Peter 2, look at verse 6. He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. You know, I hear a lot of people mock and laugh at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to tell you something. Notice Peter says, this is an example to us that God would not tolerate and God would not wink at and God would not excuse sin that continued on. God dealt with the sin. God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's interesting when you take your Bible and go back to Genesis 19, you remember that Abraham prayed, Lord, if I find 50 righteous, would you spare it? Yes. 40, yay. 30, yay. He went all the way to 10. He said, Lord, if I find 10 righteous, will you spare the city? And in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, they could not find 10. You ever thought about how the sinful that nation, that city must have been? And the time came when God's wrath was poured out. God gave them opportunity. God let them hear the word. God warned them, but then the time ran out and God sent forth his wrath. Now, isn't that something we need to think about? He spared not the city of Spodom and Gomorrah. And when he said, I will destroy it, there was no escape. Only Lot and his daughters got out. I want to tell you something, my friend. We can look at that, and what we need to see is that God uses warning. God uses time. God uses all these things to help us understand the importance of some. But there comes a time God's patience runs out. But then if you take your Bible, look at a fourth thing. Look in your Bible in the Roman letter and the 11th chapter. And in the Roman letter, you'll remember in chapter 9 and 10, he's talking about the seed of Abraham and Israel's rejection of the Lord. But notice what he says, beginning at verse 20. In verse 20, he said, Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness if. There's the condition. You continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Now here were the Jews who had rejected God, and notice because of their rejection, he cut them off, and now he gives a warning to the Gentile. Gentiles, just because you've been grafted in, don't think he won't cut you off too. If you do not continue in that which is right and good and walking in light and doing right, he said, you too can be cut off. He looked at that statement very carefully. God spared not. I want to tell you, I think that is a powerful statement. He said, if God did not spare the Jews, what makes you think he'll spare you Gentiles if you do not keep the word? Now then, if the lesson was to end there, I think about a sad picture. But I want you to look at one last passage. Turn with me to the Roman letter and the 8th chapter. At least one last point. And notice what the Apostle Paul had to say in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He didn't spare his own son either. You ever looked at Jesus? Have you ever thought that God allowed his son to leave the glories of heaven, put on robes of flesh, dwell among sinful humanity? He allowed him to come and serve and humble himself even to the point of death, as Philippians 2, to the death of a cross? 
Why would he allow him to do that? So we could be saved because had he spared his son, he couldn't spare us. His son went to the cross to remove the curse that was on us. His son went to the cross and willingly laid down his life so that we can have redemption of our sin. In Ephesians 1, 7, he talked about there's redemption in the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the blood that was shed, there would be no redemption. There would be no hope. God did not spare his only son because he needed a perfect lamb, a perfect spotless sacrifice to take away our sin. When I read in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 about the message of the cross being foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You think about how many people today look at this and they look at someone standing up preaching and they say, that's foolish. Someone talking about a cross and someone dying on the cross and this someone was God, is God and he left heaven and he died for us. That's foolish. I remember a man in Huntsville, Alabama one time. I was there listening to a debate and he was declaring himself an atheist and he said that was the most foolish thing he could think of. I want to tell you, it's foolish if you don't believe in God and you don't believe in the love of God, that he would allow his son to die. And that man said to me, he said, I wouldn't allow that to happen. Why would God allow his son to die? I want to tell you why. Because if he hadn't, every one of us would be in hell. Not a one of us would have hope. And I want to tell you, Christ is the only way to be saved. There's no other way. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, when the apostle Peter was speaking, he said, nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's the only way. Take your Bible for just a moment and look in Hebrews chapter 10. And notice in Hebrews chapter 10, if you reject the sacrifice of Christ, you have no other hope. Look, if you will, in verse 26. To people who were wanting to leave Christ and go back to an old covenant, he said, if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Now, notice there, sacrifice. He doesn't say there no longer remains forgiveness. What he's saying is if you reject the sacrifice of Christ, you walk away from Christ, there's no other hope for you. There's no other way for you. You're lost. It's only through the cross and the sacrifice for our sin that Jesus died. We have hope. And you know something, my friend? I'm fearful that in our day and time, we've gotten away from preaching that. We almost make it sound like everybody's going to heaven. You turn on the television and you'll find some of the most vile and ungodly people who've walked on the face of the earth. When they die, we just say, well, they're up there in heaven enjoying it. And I want to tell you something, my friend. That's not what the Bible says. But I want you to ask a question. Will God spare you? And the only reason God will spare us is if we're in Christ. What did Jesus say in Matthew 11? Come unto me, in verse 28. All ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. But if you reject God, God will not spare you. If he didn't spare the angels, he didn't spare the ancient world, he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't spare the Jews or Gentiles when they left, I want to ask you what makes us think he will spare us. After he's given his son, what more can he do? To reject and walk away from Jesus is the greatest insult. Look at one last verse, and I hope it brings it all into focus. Look at Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi 3, you remember that there were some who were robbing God. They were going contrary to God's will. They were complaining about God. They were not sacrificing according to the law. They were doing everything that was just an insult to God. They've robbed God. But look at verse 16. There were some amongst them, always a remnant, who were faithful. It said, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. He said, here are people in the midst of an ungodly age, in the midst of an ungodly world, who continue to do right. And notice what he says about him in verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, now watch it, and I will spare them. 
as a man spares his own son who serves him, though he didn't spare his own. He allowed him to die so that we can become sons and daughters of God. So we can be made right with God. And then he says, you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who doesn't serve. I want to know, my friend, are we making up the jewels of God? Will he spare us? He'll only spare us if we're in Christ. I have one question for you. As we bring this lesson to a close, on the day of judgment, will you be spared?